I would like to begin by welcoming the Holy Spirit. Come, will you come, Holy Spirit? We need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and come in thy power. Come in thy own special way. The title of my talk is The Love of a Mother. On December 5th, 1967, over 50 years ago, maybe 56 years ago, the long-awaited nine months was over, and the blessed time of giving birth had arrived. As the scene unfolds here at Hammett Hospital, in the delivery room, I experienced a silence. It engulfed the delivery room. A silence, even after all these years, I will never forget. The first voice that I heard was that of my doctor bending low and eye level with me, saying, Mrs. Karam, you just gave birth to a baby girl, and she was still born. Alone, My husband wasn't with me because they weren't allowed that time in the delivery room. But I was not forgotten because God's peace reigned. Well, the days passed, and it was time to leave the hospital without our baby. But with a renewed endeavor in serving the Lord and becoming a more committed Christian Number two, I left with the hope of spending a never-ending eternity with our daughter named Beth Ann. And number three, I left with the feeling that I, I was a mother. And heaven became a reality. And later, God did give us two beautiful baby boys. Well, I've experienced longevity of a mother, a mother's love. When I was employed at the elderly facility, and I I never forgot this scene, unforgettable scene, when I looked up from the office and a resident was wheeling her wheelchair to the office. And she said to me, may I use your telephone? I am so concerned about my son. I haven't heard from him in a long time. I wonder if he's sick. I said, Thelma, how old is your son? And she said, well, he's about 76. (laughs) That is an example of a love of a mother and the longevity of a mother. Well, anyway, another example of a mother's love was in the Bible. And you know what? Her name wasn't even mentioned. It said, a mother waiting and waiting for the return of a son. And her son was a warrior looking out the lattice not a panoramic view, not a large scene, but the scripture said she cried, looking through the lattice, waiting for the chariot wheels to come, waiting for the hoofbeats of a horse. That was the wonderful love of a mother. And you know, today there are many mothers still waiting for the return of their child. They don't have a clear vision. They don't know where their child is, many of them. They don't know what their child is doing, but God knows. And mothers are praying for the return of their child to return to our Father in heaven. There are many ladies listening, and they say, well, I'm not a mother. And some 
never will be a mother. But you can be his hand extended, reaching out to children, a smile, a kind word. And you can also help a mother as she's raising her children. A long time ago, there was a teenager that attended our church. I had never seen him before, and I have never seen him since. But somehow I glanced back, and he was lying down during the message on our benches. And our benches do not have cushions in them. So I remember there was a pillow in the back of our church. So I went back. I gave him a pillow. I hope I smiled. But he wasn't my son, but he was a son of some mother somewhere. So you can have the love of a mother, and you can make a difference, and you can be the hand of the Lord extended. Being a mother is a very high and holy calling. Sometimes it's very difficult. But remember, on this Mother's Day, the wonderful words of a great hymn, Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we've already come. But his grace has brought us safe thus far. And God's grace will lead us home. Well, we talked about the mother's relationship to children. But how about the children's relationship to their mother? I would like to review with you a scene that transpired about 2,000 years ago. Recorded in John 19, verses 26 and 27. And I will paraphrase this. Our Savior, hanging on the cross, tortured to death, in agony, bearing the sin and reproach. But he still remembered his mother, saying, Mother, I give you John. As your son, turning to John, I'm sure he's, I give you my mother. Now we know from scripture that this was a short term, term agreement. But I love this part. At that scripture said, is that very hour John took her, Mary, into his own house. He acted upon his promise. I can see them in my vision eyes. I can see, I can vision them walking off arm in arm. And I believe that Jesus was aware of this also. Well, in closing, I would like to spell a word that means the world to me. M. M is for the million things she's done for me. O means only that she's growing older. T is for the tears she shed to save me. H is for her heart of purest gold. E is for the everlasting love. R means right she always tried to be. Put them all together, and they spell mother, a word that means the world to me. May God bless all of our mothers, and you were a wonderful listening audience. And now I present to you Leah, a mother of three little ones, and she's a wonderful mother. And Jane, you always make things seem effortless. (laughs) Well, this morning, um, I wanted to share some of the meditations of my heart regarding mothers. Motherhood is an ever-evolving calling, an ever-evolving calling. As we look out over the audience, we can see the many stages of motherhood. 
I am at the beginning of my stages, and I see many and how it has progressed. But it's always moving forward, and, and it's a never stationary calling. You think you have it down in one stage, and then it, you move along to the next. But if we could summarize at the heart of it, it is a call to, I believe we could summarize it as a call to nurture and to bring flourishing in your children. And I hope we can see a relevance of this for all of us, whether God has brought us to natural motherhood or um, to fulfill the call as spiritual mothers in Israel to those around us. In scripture, women are often portrayed as the hands and feet, investing in needs naturally and spiritually. We see Dorcas was full of good works, making clothing for those in need. In Acts chapter 9, Lois and Eunice that instilled a faith that stood sure in the dear, their dear Timothy. In Second Timothy, as it is even written of a third party of what they sowed in his life that was lasting and eternal. And they, what they have in common is that they used their resources and vision that they had to bring a flourishing around them. Uh, at the outset, I don't believe any of us, if we talk to each other individually, can say that we were really fully prepared for the journey of motherhood. It's exciting, and as Aunt Jane mentioned, as you carry a child in your womb, you just don't know what the twists and turns will hold or how great the needs will be that will press us or the joy that it will bring. We can't be fully prepared. I think I can think back to the delivery room for myself and just realize the the joy that came, but also the weight that came that... There is an eternal soul that is depending on you. That is the burden of motherhood that comes upon you that you don't expect or, or realize. It never leaves you no matter your age or that of your children. It is an eternal weight, but is a beautiful, a beautiful calling. God has designed the world to to be raised up and run in, in the care of families of which children need loving care and tending. Again, that, that weight that comes upon a mother is the realizing, you know, they depend on you for their very food. If the mother doesn't run in her courses to carry out, um, bringing clothing and food or to, to help them on their courses of attitudes and habits to, to form their very lives, they would fall flat. And so, you know, oh, we see a mother that has a burden and it, it, it brings to pass many things. She's called to invest because of this burden that has come upon her. And, and from that, we can see a great reward, a great fruit in their lives and even those around In Proverbs 22, 6, we know well, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Abigail Adams once echoed this thought with the image of a tree. She said, In youth, the mind is like a tender twig, which you may bend as you please, but in age, like a sturdy oak and hard to move. As the age of our children, so is the flexibility of the courses they walk on. And the mother has a part in the forming with the gentle pressure to, to, to guide them in the ways of the Lord, to guide them in the way they should go. You know, some trees we know may require a little bit more just constant pressure to go in the right direction, while others need a different method to keep going in the right way that they might already desire. But we want to recognize that the place of a mother has such an influence even at a young age on those that are of a a tender young mind to lead them in the ways of the Lord, 
to find paths for their feet and make grooves for them that they will not soon depart from. So we can sow to their lives and reap an eternal reward. And to encourage a mother never to lose heart because it is the patient, steady faith and investment of a mother that has left a lasting mark on great men. Even as Susanna Wesley, you know, he was, she was spoken of by her son John Wesley with such a loving recollection. He recollected the constant investment with all ten of her children that lived and carried on their lives. Although she had mothered 19 of them, 10 of them were raised to adulthood by her. And he was able to relate with much of her daily investments. And I think that many mothers would think that their sons or daughters would not notice their investments. But he was able to relate the things that she sowed in daily, day in and out. And undoubtedly by relaying these things that he noticed, he wanted to um, see others continue that legacy that she had left him. And so it is a very important calling for a mother. And just as a mother, as I said, tends, you feel the weight of the burden of the need, and so God has called us to rise up and to to bless our families, our children, and to supply their need. We have young saplings for a time, but we see that we have a lifelong calling to manage the storehouses of our home, even after your children have long gone. Your investment of building your house continues your whole life, and the habits and pains a mother takes to improve the processes of her home benefit everyone within it. Without her, there is a void that would not be able to be filled completely. Her organizing, resourcefulness with what she's given, uh, the lists of improvement she gives you show her thoughtfulness in tending the home. And so she invests her time in considering the affairs of her house, and these are not overlooked by the Lord. They are a part of God's calling for her in her home as she labors to raise up her family. And we know very well from Proverbs 31, a portrait, again, of what God calls ideal and beautiful in the calling of a mother, in that she she rises while it's night to give meat to her house, to those around her. She's not afraid of the snow for her household because they are clothed. These are the products of her investment. And we know that a mother delights in providing foods that will nourish her family. If there's a deficiency in the diet, she takes great pains to think about how to add to it. She looks to bring pleasure to all that come into her home by the way she she feeds them. We see a mother delighting in clothing her children uh, as they grow so quickly and their needs change so quickly. She is ready and there and she has seen the course and she seeks to store up to be ready for that next stage that her children come to, to bring them comfort and meet their needs. And I have noticed in so many mothers that I admire how they love to have some little treasure tucked away that they can pull out and bless um, a child with. It is the essence of a, a heart of a mother to to store up and then to give it out, to bring delight to, to her children. I've even witnessed, you know, a grandmother who's aging and has very little, but um, the sweetness that, you know, she gave a box of tea and cookies, what she had to um, those little ones that visited her. And it was a blessing. It was a blessing because she gave her sweet thoughtfulness and it, it is a scent that just never leaves a mother. It doesn't have to be extravagant, but the Lord uses what is in a mother's hands to bless others. 
and to continue joyfully in our labors. I believe the Lord wants us to have a right understanding that he is not one that just orders our labors afar off, as it might seem like a list in Proverbs 31, but rather he comes alongside us in our duties and our investments so that we can do all things well for his glory. And I, I know that the Lord met with me once on this, you know, sorting out the nature and the character of our Lord for ourselves. You know, he showed me a time when I was washing dishes and he was right next to me, beside me. He is not afar off in these investments because it is his calling and he has promised to be with us in our calling. He delights in the calling he's placed us in. And long ago, a mother, long before I was ever a mother or thought of it, I don't even think I was out of high school, a mother shared a thought with me that has stuck with me. She said, you are raising your children one day to leave you. And before that course of my life had even started, it was funny to think of that, you know, because your children are always with you. But a mother has a vision and a thought of, what do I want my children to leave with when they leave my home? What do I want them to take with them? And naturally speaking, a mother wants to see her children ready and capable to care for themselves, to be successful, care for others. But we would fall short in our calling if we stopped there. A family is not just made up of natural provisions or investing in in physical needs. We are spirits and our children crave spiritual food from us. We are not just managers of the storehouses of food and clothing to to give out, but we are managers of the spiritual storehouses needed that our children so desperately need to be fed with. In our society, it may seem that, uh, you know, the the burden on a mother is just um, something you, you bear and you drudge through. Or it might be betrayed that she doesn't have much to give, but she gives what she can. But I want us to lift our eyes and to see that, mothers, you have many treasures and jewels in your storehouse, which God has given you to bless those around you with, whether they are your natural children or as spiritual mothers in Israel. Have you found the key to contentment in your home, in your place? Have you found the proper love for yourself and for others? Overcoming emotional distresses? Have you found secrets to entering into God's presence and maintaining your relationship and walk with him? These two are spiritual stores that the Lord wants to breathe upon to bless your children, that they can just not just receive physical nourishment, but spiritual nourishment, spiritual tracks to, to dwell in. Again, in Proverbs 31, it says, she, she makes fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. So her, her investments extend far beyond her own home. They should clothe her own home and far beyond as well. Our overcoming can seem very silent, but it is readily witnessed by all, even when there are no words spoken. Mothers, know that your nature and your overcoming matters for your family. It stirs the body of Christ to join together and to be provoked to love and good works as we see that love poured out through a mother's heart. And many times we don't realize the impact we are having on others or even the treasures we might have in our storehouse unless we really take time to sit down and meditate on what the Lord has brought me through. And, you know, Lord, please help me to put it into words so that it will be ready to give out. You know, just as you take in a harvest of tomatoes or fruit and you need to process it and make it prepared and preserved to hand out to those who come. So we want to do this by meditating on what God has brought us through 
that we can make it simple, understandable, and ready to give out when the Lord breathes on it. When the Lord says, this is time to bring out that can of preserves, that thing that I did in your life many years ago even. In Proverbs 25, 11 and 12, it says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. And so we know that our mothers have been used, we can tell from our own experience, to both um, to help redirect areas that should not be built up and both build up things that we want to encourage. And it is often God that uses a mother's words to sow those things in her children. She has an access to her children's heart that few others will ever have because it is she that they run to in, in their hour of need for nurture and comfort if they are hurt, no matter if it's a skin knee or a heart that has been hurt many years down the road after they've left your home. And right words and good understanding can be as real as giving treasure into your children's hands because you have access to their hearts. Our words are our nature, and they can affect others' nature for good if they are right and true. They also are an investment. And in closing, the nature of a mother What she lays up and invests in matters for her home. She maintains the storehouses of her home naturally and those of the spirit to add to what is outgrown, to, you know, discern whether there's something more needed, to wait on the Lord saying, there's something lacking, Lord, I need to receive from you that we can better equip our children. And it is God's design for a mother, motherhood to press us, to invest, to meet natural needs, and to sow into their spirits. And may we find that grace to overcome for ourselves that we can deliver the treasures God wants to flow through us to our children. Amen? And now we have Sister Debbie. Back in 2011, I was the speaker for our Mother's Day service, so I just kind of pulled my information from something I spoke back then, and it still applies today. But we heard many good things, and some of the things that you, we've, all, we've heard, we already have heard. But, so I was thinking of the words that make up a mother. And when I think of a mother, these are the words that I think of. Love, comfort, Protection, mercy, humility, godliness, respect, gentleness, and we could go we could go on and on. Well, the one word that comes to my mind out of all of the things that I can think of is selflessness. Selflessness. Totally opposite of selfishness. Many in our world today, it's the me, they call it the me generation. It's full of selfishness. But a true mother becomes selflessness. And as we've heard already, that when a woman becomes a mother, she will never be the same again, no matter what God has put in her path of what that motherhood looks like. So when we think of all these things, God honors mothers and thinks that they are a blessing. He created the mother. He created Eve, and he knew what what he wanted her to look like, totally opposite of the father. But when we heard these words about what a mother is, love, comfort, protection, mercy, we think of God, right? 
So when he created Eve, he wanted her to possess those qualities. There is something about a mother. I was thinking of this. Now, when she has that baby in her womb, there's a relationship there that's like no other relationship on earth. Even the father can have a wonderful relationship, but there is nothing that is like that where that baby and that mom are together. It it is a bonding that just isn't any other relationship can compare. So God created the first woman, Eve, and in creating her, he knew the attributes that he wanted her to possess. He had already created Adam, and he had the father side of God, but he wanted to convey the other side of his character, the mother side. And there are many scriptures where God speaks about this. And in Isaiah 66, 13, he's speaking to Jerusalem, and he, in verse 12 it says, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. And then down in verse 13, As one whom his mother comforteth, so I comfort you. So God is using the example of a mother to illustrate his perfect love. In Isaiah 48, 15, God says, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, but I will not forget thee. And in Proverbs 1, 8, we have the scripture that says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father. And then it says, Forsake not the law of thy mother. So here we have the mother representing the law of God. And then Paul, in one of his letters, he's, he writes in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, But we were gentle among you even as a nurse to her children. It speaks of gentleness of a mother. In Matthew 23, 37, we have the scripture that says, you hear the heart cry of God say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stone them which were sent unto thee, how often, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. This is one of the most beautiful aspects of God. As mothers, because God himself felt the rejection of his people, his own flesh, and sometimes mothers have to feel the rejection of their own children. I was at a party last night and speaking with this other woman, and we were talking about Mother's Day. And you know, Mother's Day can be bittersweet for a lot of people. And I noticed on Facebook, there were a lot of people that were saying, oh, if only, if only I had another day that I could walk with my mom. If only. And I have a dear cousin who Mother's Day will not be happy for her because her child is estranged from her, and she has felt nothing but rejection. I'm not trying to be down. We've heard many beautiful things. But really, motherhood is something else. You know, there's the pain of bringing forth that child. And so in motherhood, you have many times of rejoicing and love and joy and elation. But then as the years go on, you don't know, as it's been already said, what, what your life holds in your child's life. There can be painful times and times of struggle. But these are characters of God, all these things, because he's long-suffering. He is selflessness. So God honors, he honors the position of the mother. There are three women of the Bible that I want to look at quickly. And these are things, 
as women in the time that we live in can use as an example. The three things are, number one, obedience, number two, faithfulness, and number three, a prayer warrior intercessor. And the three women are Mary, the mother of Jesus, Elizabeth, the mother of John, and Anna, the prophetess. When you think of Mary, she was exceptional for a young woman of her age. And when the angel came to her and told her that God wanted her to be the mother of his son and what an important part she would play, it says in Luke one thirty eight, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. She knew that she could be rejected. Think about, she was putting her reputation on the line to be misunderstood by the community that she lived in, by even Joseph himself. He could have made a public example. But in all that she did, what God wanted her to do, she was going to be a co-worker with God. Just like I spoke that we as mothers, it's an honor to be given the children that God has given us And they are not our own, as we heard, but they are God's. And Mary didn't know all that was going to happen when this request was made to her, but she was willing and obedient. And she instilled this quality to her son, Jesus. And we know that that is one of the greatest qualities of Jesus because he always said, Not my will, but thine be done. And Jane had already mentioned, and I was thinking about this, you know, Mary was honored by Jesus, and he didn't want her to be left by herself when he was, as Jane had already beautifully said, when he was dying on the cross. Jesus loved his mother. Elizabeth. In Elizabeth, we see faithfulness. We all know the story. Elizabeth and her husband, it says in Luke how they were both righteous before God and walking in all the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord, and they were blameless. But there was one thing. Elizabeth was barren. And in that time period of barrenness, it was a reproach. And you could only be in that condition. People thought if something must be wrong, you must, God must be displeased with you. And there was probably whispering in the marketplaces and pointing of the finger and saying, oh, do you know, do you see Elizabeth? She's barren. And these things happened in her life. I mean, we don't think about that. I was thinking to, you know, someday when we get to heaven, we're going to hear the the real story of how, you know, they felt, because not all the times it's it's said how they actually have felt. But can you imagine? It must have been hard for Elizabeth. Have you ever had this happen in your life where people misunderstood you, think things about you that aren't true? We can even misjudge other people and their situations, and we can misjudge our own situations. But to be misunderstood is one of the greatest heartaches. But what was Elizabeth's attitude? And we already heard about a beautiful prophecy about overcoming. Her attitude was to stay faithful to God. And because of that, he greatly rewarded her and granted her a child who is John the Baptist. So in all our circumstances, whether we understand them or not, remain faithful. And in doing so, you will pass on this quality to your children. So the last woman we want to look at is Anna. She was a prayer warrior. And it says in Luke 2, verses 36 through 38, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, And she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow 
about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she, coming in that instance, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Israel. So we have few verses speaking about this remarkable woman, but we see that she was a prayer warrior. And then it says that she spoke to others, so she was also a teacher. And so in that, I believe that God wants us as women in this century to be those that are obedient, that are faithful, and that are prayer warriors. As it has already been said, that some women will never have a natural child, but you can have spiritual children. And God wants us to be women of prayer. And he wants us to uphold other women. And he wants us to pray for other people's children. I saw this morning, I don't know if it was a vision or just something in my mind, but I saw women at war. You know, Mother's Day was created at a time back, let me find where I had that because that was something that I, it was created at a time back during the Civil War and they brought Mother's Day. Julia Ward Howe, the writer of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, made a proclamation 1870 during a time of war, killing and carnage of the Civil War, Her proclamation was a call on mothers to come together to pray and to protest the fertility of war, sons of mothers killing other sons of mothers. And so her proclamation was one of peace and prayer for the nation. Let them then solemnly take counsel with each other as to the means whereby the great human family can live in peace each bearing after his own time the sacred impression, not of Caesar, but of God. In this vision that I saw, I saw women in battle. I saw women that were going and they were lifting up other women that were down on their knees. And I was thinking, you know, we can be, Mothers, we can have that mother's heart that God wants us to give to other people that come across our path. They can be older than you, but that doesn't mean you can't have the mother's heart toward them to think about them and intercede for them and pray for them. Maybe they're like in their 70s, like Jane had mentioned, the 70s. And maybe their, their mother who had prayed, maybe she was a praying mother, but she didn't get to see the fruit of her prayers. And so wouldn't that be an honor for her because you thought of that person and prayed? God, give me that mother's heart for people. Give me that mother's heart for others. And I was thinking, I was talking, we were talking again last night. I was talking to a couple of teachers and we were talking about the world we live in and where the children of this world are in. They are not being raised in godly homes. They don't have that blessing. And so if we could pray for others' children, so, you know, God give us that heart for others. That, that's what I want in my life. I want to have a heart for others and to pray for them. And so that is my encouragement to you this day. I thank you all for the, the mothers that you are, and both naturally and spiritually. And let us continue on. Because it is an honor and a blessing to be a mother. Because God created that. He created the mother's heart. Amen?